All right, we're in Revelation chapter 2. We're going to be starting in verse 12, looking at the church of Pergamos. And we're going to be talking about a few different things tonight. First of all, the picture that Jesus gives us of the sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth and what that represents. And then also, not yet, Roger, we're not ready. Don't worry, we'll get there. Roger's excited tonight. Yeah, he's ready to go. And then also, Satan's dominion over this earth talks about Satan's throne in this section, so that's going to be a fascinating thing we're going to be talking about tonight, and also the doctrine of Balaam, and if you don't know who Balaam is, we'll talk more about it when we get there, but it's a fascinating thing that is going to be, as as we enter the end times, we're already seeing these things happen, it's been happening since the beginning of time, but ultimately, these things are going to get worse and worse the sins and the lust of the flesh and all the debauchery in our nation and frankly in the world is going to get worse and worse. And God has given us this letter so that we can see these things ahead of time, know that they are coming and hold fast to who he is because in all of these personal notes that Jesus Christ has written to these seven churches, one thing that he says over and over again is the one who endures until the end. The one who sticks with him until the end is the person who's going to receive eternal life. It doesn't matter if you stop following him halfway through or three quarters of the way through. The people that endure until the end and follow him and desire him and repent of their sins and draw close to him are those who are going to have eternal life. Let's start reading here in verse 12. And it says, To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things, says he who has the sharp sharp two-edged sword, I know your works and where you dwell where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Yes, Lord, we thank you that you have great plans for us and that all we have to do is stick with you. Do your works. Follow your will, God. And you have this great eternal kingdom planned for us with such beautiful things a relationship with you where we get to see you face to face, God. Now we look through a glass dimly, but then our faith shall be our eyes. We shall know you personally. And God, I can't wait for that day. What a beautiful day it is. And God, that's why I just desire that we would know the truth Because you said it's the truth that sets us free. And God, we desire freedom in your name. We desire to know you personally. And so God, would you do that in each one of us tonight? Would you open our hearts to receive from you what you desire? To grow in our relationship with you. 
and to walk in your ways, to repent of our sins and to live righteously before you, God. May this time just be of you. Would your spirit just fall on us and would you minister to us spirit to spirit, God? For our God is spirit and we must worship him in spirit and in truth. God, would you give us that tonight? an opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. Would this time not be of me and would it not be of the things of man, but would it be of you? And God, even though we're grateful for your will being done in the election last night, we know you have a great plan that you're gonna do through all those who were elected and we pray for them right now that your spirit would come upon them, that the fear of God would come upon them. And God, that they would do your will and they would follow after you and they would bless this nation and bless the whole world. But the rest of the world looks to us as an example. And God, I pray that we would be a great example of who you are being a great light to this world and drawing people to your name. So bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Now Jesus says to the church at Pergamos that he is the one with the sharp two-edged sword that proceeds out of his mouth. Go ahead and put it up, Roger. I know it's hard to see, but you could see it there. This is actually the best depiction I could find on the internet of what John is seeing in this vision. That sharp two-edged sword that comes out of Jesus's mouth is representative of his word. But the scriptures tell us in Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any what? Two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What he's saying is his word cuts you to the heart. What I found in reading the word and drawing closer to God is that you can't read the word and remain unchanged because it cuts through all the ridiculousness of life and all the walls you put up and all the facade of this person that you try to make yourself out to be. And it cuts you right to the heart because God knows who you actually are. Praise the Lord. There's no acting with God. He knows exactly who we are. And His Word... To us, just like to these seven churches, cuts them to the heart. He does what he does to lift us up and to edify us and also to admonish us and exhort us to live pure in him, to live righteously in him, that we would be good examples of who he is, being his ambassadors. He says, these things that he said in his word are the things that changes hearts and lives. It's the things that changes people, no matter who they are, no matter where they've been, no matter what they've done. God is the only one who can change a heart. And he says this about it in Isaiah 55, verse 11. He says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God has sent his word to give truth to the nations that those who love the truth would come out of the ways of the world and they would walk in the ways of the spirit, in the ways of God, and that this world wouldn't have a hold on them anymore, but instead 
They would be living for the kingdom of God. He says, that's what I've sent it for. To accomplish what I please. And the scriptures tell us that it's this truth that God wants us to chase after. Because if you don't chase after it, and you chase after the lies of this world and the lusts of the flesh, he says you will be given over to the lies. You will be given over to the lusts of your flesh so that you can't even believe the truth anymore. But that instead you believe the lie and you are permanently separated from God. Understand that this is what is going to happen. We see all the crazy lies that there are out there in our world today and that they're perpetuated in such an amazing way, actually. You know, they say that lies spread six times faster than truth does. Isn't that fascinating? Why? Because of Satan's spiritual power that he has over the lie. We've looked at lies in depth. You know, Satan is the father of lies. And so he is the one who's perpetuating these lies and making them spread throughout all the whole, the whole earth. And yet it's Jesus's word that is truth and that truth will set us free. Roger, if you'll go back to the picture for me. Now it is that double-edged sword there that Jesus will have coming out of his mouth when he comes back to fight the battle of Armageddon during his second coming. It says he's riding on a white horse and that sharp two-edged sword is coming out of his mouth with which he will strike down the nations. In the battle of Armageddon, all the nations are bringing their armies to the valley of Megiddo outside of Jerusalem. It's a huge, I wish I would have had a picture of this. It's a huge valley in Israel. And they're all bringing their armies there. And yet Jesus is going to come back in that moment, riding on a white horse, and he's going to conquer all of them with that sword. Now, what does that sword represent? Truth, absolutely. But his word, totally, his word. You know, it's the same thing that happened at the beginning of creation. You see, in creation, God spoke and things came to be. God has a power to simply speak and to create or to destroy. And so that sword that you see coming out of his mouth, mouth, excuse me, is representative of that, of the word of God, cutting us to the heart, the sharp two-edged sword, dividing between soul and spirit, bones and marrow. It's his word, the word of God. And just as he created at the beginning, so he's going to come back during his second coming, fighting that battle, and he's going to strike down all those armies with the word of his power. In that moment, it says that he comes back riding with the saints, although the saints aren't doing anything. It's Jesus Christ himself who wins that battle and goes on to set up his kingdom where he will rule and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. We'll get to that. I don't want to give you too much. I have to give you a spoiler alert. But you see what it represents and what God has made his word to be. Truth. The entire word of God. Now, God's sovereignty over all of this world is represented in this, that he is the ruler of it and he's totally in control. However, he has given Satan a dominion on this earth and he's called, Satan is called, the prince of the power of the air. So God has given him this power over the nations. Now, don't get me wrong when I say this, okay? Everybody listen up because I want you to hear what I'm going to say. You have to be very clear here. Yes, God has given Satan power and dominion, but God is still sovereign over everything. 
even Satan. We see this outlined in Job where Satan comes to the throne of God and has to give an account for what he's been doing. God says, hey, Satan, where you been? And Satan says, well, I've been going to and fro over the whole earth doing my thing. You see, Satan works for God. Even though Satan thinks and wants you to believe that he is equal with God and can fight against God, he can't. There is nothing Satan can do that God hasn't signed off on. God is fully in control. He is sovereign over everything. Now, some people don't like this because they see the devastating things that happen in our world and the bad things that happen in our world. And they say, how could a good God allow these bad things to happen? Well, you know what's fascinating about this is we only see from our perspective. We see from a mortal perspective, from a fleshly perspective. While God sees from a spiritual perspective, he sees from a heavenly perspective. He sees the end from the beginning. He knows how everything is going to work out. Every person that would come to him, every person that would receive him, and every person that wouldn't receive him. And so he's doing everything he possibly can to draw people to himself. He says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. He says he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So God is sovereign. And you know what's fascinating about this is that I'll tell you a little story, and I won't use names, but we um, have some friends have some friends of ours who just lost someone very close to them, and it's always difficult. This person was young when they died, and it's always difficult when a young person dies. And of course, everyone in the family is asking why. Why, God, would you take someone so young? But you know, what God always seems to do is bring good out of evil. He brings good things out of bad things. And we were talking to a family member of the person who died, who we met not long ago, and really at that point did not have an interest in who God was. And yet, this young person dies, and we talk to that person who didn't have an interest in God before again. And today, that person is now more interested in God than ever. And even says, told us, that they've really been praying and seeking God since that happened. And I'm like, wow, God, you're amazing that you can take such a horrific situation and yet use that to bring eternal life. Eternal life. Not just life here, but eternal life. What a gift. So God is sovereign and you have to see him in his sovereignty. But he has, as he says here, given Satan a dominion here on this earth. And he says right here that in Pergamos is where that dominion is centered. His throne, Satan's throne, is in Pergamos. Would you put up the map for me, please, Roger? You see Pergamum right there at the top? Fascinating, right? I'm doing research on this just to find out if the location means anything. I'm super interested in this. Because we know that Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign from Jerusalem, which is like on the map over, uh, where are we? No, it's down here. On the map down here, bottom right. And yet Satan's throne is right there, not far from where Jesus is going to be ruling and reigning. I don't know. I just find it fascinating and I want to know more about it. The fact that God even gave Satan a throne on the earth, I think is fascinating. But to give you a picture of what this dominion looks like, I want to take you into Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus is being tempted by Satan in the wilderness as he's fasting. 
So Jesus, as he's stepping into his ministry, is baptized by John, and the Holy Spirit comes upon him and immediately leads him out into the wilderness to be tested. And he fasts 40 days and 40 nights. And at the end of that, well, towards the end of it, he's tested by Satan. And one of the three things that Satan does to him is take him to a very high mountain. In fact, that's where we'll pick this up. It says again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. This gives you a direct picture of the power that God has given Satan. It says he's given Satan power over all the kingdoms of the world. Isn't that fascinating? All the kingdoms of the world, because if he didn't have dominion over them, he couldn't offer them to Jesus. So over all the kingdoms of the world, he's given him dominion, so much so that he could offer them to Jesus. Thank God Jesus didn't take it, because here's the one thing that I'll tell you about Satan's dominion, is there is an end date. It's not an eternal dominion. It's not an eternal kingdom. But it will end. And anyone who buys into Satan's kingdom to build it, which is building your own kingdom, essentially. If l- Let me make this clear. If you're building anyone's kingdom but God's kingdom, you're building Satan's kingdom. I'll just make it very frank. Because here it says that he has dominion over all the kingdoms of the world. The only kingdom that he doesn't have dominion over is God's kingdom. So if you're building any other kingdom, whose kingdom are you building? It's very clear. There's only one kingdom of God. And that is the only kingdom that will remain forever. Every other kingdom will fall, including the devil's kingdom. Now, how all this works when it comes to God's sovereignty and yet the devil's dominion is very fascinating and it's something that we probably will not know on this side of heaven. Yet, we know from the scriptures, like this, that God has given Satan a dominion over the earth, so much so that he could offer it to someone to give it to them, just like he's going to give it to the Antichrist, who is going to be the leader of the one world government. It says he's empowered by Satan, the ancient serpent. We'll get there too. And yet God, even though Satan has this dominion over the whole earth, is sovereign over all of that, and is using Satan to get his work done. In fact, he's using all of the demonic spirits to get his work done because it says that when Satan fell, he took a third of the angels with him. A third of the angels said, I don't want to worship God anymore, and I don't want to follow him. I want to follow Satan. And they tried to exalt Satan as God. Can't be done, but that's what they wanted. Then... It goes on to say in verse 14, he says, but I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Now, let me tell you this story really quick. What happened here is the children of Israel by the millions were coming out of Egypt And they were headed to the promised land. And yet at the Arnon Gorge, which is a a fascinating geological site, you can go there today, and there is this huge gorge. You can go up to the top of it. It's a mountain, essentially. And then that gorge leads to a great valley. And in that valley, all of Israel was camped. 
And it says that Balak went up to the top of this and was looking at all of them and thinking, oh boy, I'm in trouble. And so what he did is he summoned Balaam, who was a prophet of God, to come and curse Israel for him so that they wouldn't take over his land. Well, that's where, you know, Balaam's riding the donkey. Balaam's donkey, anybody heard of that? Balaam's riding the donkey and the Lord is threatening to kill him three times and yet the donkey saves him and then the donkey starts talking to him. All that happened. And it was basically the Lord getting a hold of Balaam saying, hey, I don't care how much they're gonna pay you. You're my prophet, you speak for me and me only. So don't curse Israel because I've blessed them. I have not cursed them, and so you can't curse them. And so this whole transaction happens between Balaam and Balak, where three times they build an altar to the Lord and they sacrifice to God, hoping to be able to curse Israel, and yet each time God says no. But even though Balaam couldn't curse Israel by saying it, what he did is allow Israel to curse themselves. Because how many of you know that if you're not following God and doing the things that he desires of you and living your life for him, he can't bless you. God can't bless you if you're not following him. And in the same way, Israel cursed themselves by not following God. Because God said, these are my statutes, these are my commandments, and these are what you need to follow. But what Balaam did is said, hey, you're the king of Moab. Send your women into the camp of Israel to seduce the men that they would fall into sexual immorality. And if they fall into sexual immorality, God can no longer bless them and they will curse themselves. So even though Balaam couldn't speak to curse them, he taught Balak a way that they would curse themselves. And they did. In the very next chapter you read in Numbers is that the Moabite women went to seduce the men and a plague of God broke out because his people weren't following him anymore. He was cursing them. And I think something like 16,000 people had died to that point. And then there's a moment, which is a beautiful moment of God and a, a, zealous, a zealousness for God and his kingdom where a man takes a spear and goes to an Israelite man who is committing sexual immorality with a Moabite woman and he takes his spear and he runs them both through, kills them both. And it says, in that moment, the plague of God desisted. It stopped the plague of God because God loved the zealousness of that man's heart. Incredible. What God desires is a heart willing to follow him no matter what the costs and the consequences are. So when it talks about here, the doctrine of Balaam, that's what it's talking about. Look, I want you to know that the doctrine of Balaam has never stopped. But it exists even now today in our world. Even in this country. How much sexual immorality do we have in our country today? It's disgusting. And yet, this is what Satan desires. All of the perverseness of sexuality in our nation today comes from the evil one. It's demonically inspired. Because he knows that even though he can't curse God without God allowing him, he knows that God's people can curse themselves by not following God. And so, 
So often we talk about, oh, Satan did this and Satan did that, and now God's punishing me or whatever. It's not as often Satan as it is us personally. More often than not, we are the issue. It's not Satan attacking us. I believe it's James that says each person is dragged away when he is caught in his own evil desires and enticed. It's our own evil desires that makes, makes us enticeable to Satan. It's so easy for him because of our lack of self-control, which is really our lack of faith in God. If you have faith in God and you trust him and you trust in his word, it makes all of the perverseness and the sexual immorality and all of the lusts of your flesh seem so small. They pale in comparison. Because your faith in God, your love for God, just overshadows the whole thing. If you have lust in any way in your heart that you're having a hard time getting rid of, Look, it's, it's not about reaching in and pulling it out and throwing away. No, it's about replacing it with the love of God. Take lust out and replace it with love. Love for God and love for his people and his children. And I guarantee you, it will change your heart. In place of the bad thing, put something that's good. Live righteously before God. He goes on to say, in verse 16, repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He says, repent. If you're caught in these things, if you're caught in the ways of the world and the lust of the flesh, repent. Come out of those sins. They're not necessary for you. They're only trying to drag you down. And yet God wants to bring you new life today. God wants to set you free from those things. That the enemy wouldn't have dominion over your life anymore. But instead, it would be God who has dominion over you in all his sovereignty. That's what he desires. He says, if you do this, if you repent, in verse 17, he says, I will give them some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone and on the stone a new name written which no one knows except him who receives it. Hidden manna, spiritual food. Manna is the spiritual food that God gave to them. What is our spiritual food? It's the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So when I say, read the Bible, I'm saying you need spiritual food. To be a Christian and to not read the Bible is like driving a car that's on empty. You're not going to get very far because you don't have spiritual food to keep you going. And yet Jesus says, hey, if you overcome, I'll give you even a greater spiritual food, hidden spiritual food, things that were held back by God from the beginning of the world, new revelation in his word, the spiritual food that when we go get to be with him, we'll have these things. We'll get to know things about God and God's word that you can never even imagine. Connections that would blow your mind. He says, this is what I'll give to you. You endure with the word here. And when you get to go be with him, you'll get even more of that hidden manna, even more of that spiritual food to know God to know the creator of the universe with such a depth and intimacy, you can't imagine it. 
you will know him so individually and be so close to him. It says, right here, I'll give him a stone with a name written on it. When you get there, you'll get a stone with your name on it. And not the name, your, your parents' given name. You will get your true God-given name. A name that only you know. Written on a stone, a little plaque for you. To say, hey, you're my child. I knew you from the very beginning. And here, I have this for you. A gift that can only be yours. So individual and so personable. It cannot even go to anybody else. It can only go to you. That's who our God is. A God who knows you personally and who is waiting for you. To him who endures till the end, to him who fights through all these things and yet holds fast to God in his word, those are the ones who are gonna receive the great reward of God that he has waiting for us. Such a gift. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the beautiful plans that you have for us. You say that you know the plans that you have for us. Plans for good and not for evil. Plans to give us a future and a hope. God, you are the only one who can give us a future and a hope. In this world, in the kingdoms of this world, there is no future. There is no hope because we know that they are all going to be destroyed one day. And yet in you, God, in you, we have future and we have hope because of what you've done for us. God, would you work in our hearts to stay close to you to take your hand and walk close by your side and let you lead our lives every single moment of every day. That we would not wander even a little bit, God. But as the days get darker, you would shine brighter in us to be salt and light, to be truth in the midst of great lies. God, that we would know you in such a personal way. We love you, Lord, and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. God's good.